many, many years ago, as a young man, seated on the veranda of our house at 40 Ratnakara Place, the same place we are living now, in the 60s, not knowing what the future holds for me and which way God wanted me to go as I was seated on that chair, Pastor Naren, I got that same verse that you read today. Psalm 138, verse 8, which said, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Now looking back, that's nearly over 50 years. I can see how God has perfected and he keeps on perfecting, bringing to completion everything God has. Soon after that, I got a job and then I was working and studying and God was perfecting his purposes for me as he called me into the ministry and I left uh, and left Sri Lanka and went to the US with $5 in my pocket. I landed in SeaTac Airport in Seattle, Washington, not knowing what the future held, not knowing also that at summertime in the US in those days, schools are closed. And uh, my school that I was going to, I didn't know the, the school was not in operation during the summertime. And here I landed at that airport, uh, not really knowing who was going to pick me up, but you know, God arranged, it's a long story, miraculously for somebody to come to that airport. It was nothing but a miraculous provision of God. I walked out of that airport with my suitcase in my hand and there were 150 Japanese who had just got off the plane. And so if I walked among those 150 Japanese, they would not have been able to, to kind of uh, figure out, I'm talking about 50 years ago, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, whether I was a Japanese or whether I was a Sri Lankan. But the Lord has chosen a person who knew what I looked like, who was from Portland, Oregon, which is a, the state uh, down south from Washington State, and he came up to Washington that day to see a friend and heard that I was coming, and there he was at the airport. He's the only one who could have recognized me, and as I took my suitcase and walked out, this guy comes and grabs me and says, Tis Savira Singh, and I got the shock of my life. That's where God works. When God works, you can take a step of faith, and move. I got into that plane not knowing what is going to happen. And God is faithful. He always has been. And when we returned, my wife and I, in 1973, December, we didn't know what the situation in Sri Lanka was like. And, uh, but the Lord had put something in my heart as to how I should work here in Sri Lanka. I had a clear plan, well, as clear as it could get. And when I landed, I realized that the situation in this country was totally different from when I had left it. Those of you who are my vintage know what the circumstances were in Sri Lanka in the early 70s. And in Siebel Avenue, we started with hardly anything not knowing where the Lord would lead us. But we were given clear directions about certain principles upon which we should build our work and ministry. And I want to tell you that up to this very day, God has been faithful. We took so many steps. I don't like to say steps of faith. It looks like you are taking credit to yourself, but I tell you, not really uh, steps of faith, but obedience to the Lord, to his direction, not really knowing how he's going to pan out in the end, but God was and is faithful. And today what you see and where you're seated and what we see in our ministries in Sri Lanka and outside of Sri Lanka are a testimony to the handiwork of God. Jesus gets all the glory. And we have to be very careful, like Peter and John, when they were outside the temple, beautiful, 
and they healed the lame man. The people came running to Peter and John and held on to them. You know, human beings have a penchant for idolizing other human beings and creating heroes and demigods. And when these people were hanging on to Peter and John, what did Peter say? He said, why are you holding on to us as if by our own power and godliness we have done this thing? That's very important. Those statements made by Peter, a lowly fisherman, are mind-blowing, philosophical, Christian philosophical statements, really. I'll tell you why. Because in worldly, non-biblical philosophy, like the religions and philosophies that we uh, are familiar with in our part of the world, people usually think, that if a person has power, then they must be close to God. Is it not? If there are demonstrations of power, then it must be because this person has a hotline to God. The sub-Christian worldview says the same thing. If you have power, you must be a holy person. And if you are a person who does not have power, sub-Christian worldview, it's probable that you are not that close to God. That's what people think, though they don't express it in that way. But the biblical worldview says, God does mighty things, not because of our power or because of our holiness. And if truth be told, there are many people who have power who are not living holy. Why is it? Because God is a God of mercy. And he uses any person who is available in order to reach other people because God's primary approach and desire is redemptive. As Christians, we need to understand the true biblical worldview, which is that all power is in God's hands. And when we live in occultic societies like Sri Lanka and in other Asian and African countries, we mix up the worldview of our society with Christianity. That is why it's so important to study the Bible the proper way and to understand what the scriptures say. So when Peter, the fisherman, got up and said those words, he was not that dumb. He was talking about the two most important factors that are part of the worldview of many, many societies. As Christian people, we know that when we walk with God, he will work through us and he will do according to his will and we need to accept his sovereignty and his purposes for our lives. And sometimes God works even though we do not have faith. Have you realized that? How many times I've experienced God's power in my life when I've had no faith at all. I remember the first time I was healed as a young man of a sickness called athlete's foot, which uh, was, uh, you know, your skin would peel off and uh, it would ooze and there was no cure for it. So I went to the doctor, the famous doctor in Veluata called Dr. Rafael, and uh, so I went to him and he looked at me and his son, there's no cure for this. I'll give you, I'll give you a, 
uh, a cream that you can apply. And uh, you had to live with it. I used to go to work with one shoe and one sandal. How do you like that? It's like medical college students coming back after their rag or something, you know? <laughs> and I, I used to go to work every day like that. And I used to go by bus. <laughs> 1960s. And then one day, there was a meeting, and there was this pastor who had come from Sweden. He was not known for having any healing gifts or anything like that. After the preaching, he, he, uh, he was praying for people, so I also went. I can't say that I was struggling with faith and I was believing and holding on and uh, uh, confessing and so on. I just went up there and he prayed for me. I went back home. Two weeks later, everything dried up and it was gone. That was it. You know, a simple prayer and the touch of God. God uses ordinary people. I was telling the uh, morning congregation. You know, some, uh, I think it was one and a half years ago, I went to Jaffna to have a series of, there was meetings there and everything. And on the way to Jaffna, I, uh, uh, they had stopped somewhere. And uh, uh, I walked across the washroom and fell and broke my uh, shoulder. Oh, I didn't feel any pain at that time. I went to Jaffna and then I couldn't move my shoulder, my arm. And so here I was like this. And uh, I remember preaching at St. John's in the big grounds for the crusade that they had with my hand like this because I didn't have a sling as it were. And Dr. Krishanti Rajasuri is one of our members who's, uh, who's at the Jaffna hospital. She came and she said, I've got to take you to hospital. We've got to check this out and all that. We went to the Jaffna Hospital and they took x-rays and everything. It was all not so good. So uh, I got on a bus back to uh, Colombo and she gave me the x-ray and she said, well, uh, she put it as gently as she could that I may have to have something done. <laughs> you know, when you have to have something done. I have been through that. Uh, but she wanted to put it gently. <laughs> so I came on the Sunday morning upstairs, fourth floor service. After the weekend, I mean from there, and I was supposed to go, and s go on Monday or Tuesday to see the doctor and see what should be done. And I was preaching like this. I had a sling, but I didn't. I removed the sling and came to church, and I put my hand like this, and I was preaching. And uh, after I finished, Julia got up, and she came, and she said, I think we should pray for Pastor. And she stood at the bottom there, and I stood where I was, and she prayed. That was it. I was healed. Gone. Pain gone. No surgery necessary. Next Sunday, I was in the service and Krishanti Rajasurya was here from Jaffna. And she was seated at the back and she saw me raise my hands. She was wondering what was going on. <laughs> God is so good. He uses ordinary people who allow the Holy Spirit to work and move through their lives. And you know, you just have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Last week, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. I didn't plan to tell you all this. Or uh, maybe about 10 days ago, uh, I, well, more than that, I realized I was having a patch in my left arm a dark blue patch. And I, I know my wife didn't assault me at night. <laughs> I know nobody else is mean to me. Pastor Naren did pull me by the hand hard. And there was no pain, but this patch just appeared and it wouldn't go. And it was one week. 
and uh, it was Friday night, I think. And I was thinking, should I go see a doctor or what? And then the thought came to me, and I believe it was the Holy Spirit. Why don't you pray? And I put my hand over that patch, didn't even touch it. And then I began to pray and start rebuking it. And would you believe it? While I was watching, the patch was disappearing. And I kept on praying. And as long as I kept praying, it went down. And then I stopped and I slept in the night and I thought in the morning it will be gone. No, it wasn't fully gone. So I started again. And every time I started praying, it went off. Little by little. And I don't, I can't explain it. But then the next day I thought now it should be fully gone. Then I started again. And I started praying again. Every time I was praying, I could see the thing going off. And now I can show you my Rambo arms. <laughs> By Thursday, it was all gone. I don't know what that patch is, but they say patches that just appear can be anything, but it's gone. What I'm saying is that listen to the Holy Spirit. God uses ordinary people who are led by the Holy Spirit. And don't let your troubles and difficulties and the challenges that you have keep you from being an instrument of God. Because the enemy would like to tell you, wait till everything is okay. And then you'll be a fit and proper person to be used by God. If you wait like that, you'll be living in hope for the rest of your life without being used by God. But what does Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 tell us? Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 tells us that all things work together for good. Present tense. Not have worked, but they are working together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Very important verse. All things, no exclusion, work together for good. If that's all it said, it would be a mysterious statement. But it says all things work together for good for those who love God. You only have that promise. On the basis of that condition that you love God. Love is not just only a feeling. I love the feelings that come with love. But love is more than a feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision. It's an action. And so when I make a choice to obey God. When I make a choice to do his will. When I make a choice to follow him. I'm expressing my love for him. Whether I feel good about it or not. There are many things that God wants us to do. Which we may not feel good doing. But we do it because we love God. And when you do it because you love God. You put yourself in the place where the power of the Holy Spirit can move through your life. All things work together for those who love God. But it's not enough to be loved by to love God. It's also important. To follow through with what the rest of the verse says. All things. Let's say it together. All things. Work together for good. To those who love God. And those who are the called. According to his purpose. You know especially in the Greek language. The definite article. The. the those who are called. Those who are the called or the called according to his purpose. That is a very important grammatical construction in the New Testament Greek language. Because it identifies and qualifies what the writer 
is speaking about or who the writer is speaking about. All things work together for good. Those who are the called ones. When you're a child of God, you are one of the called ones. You're a special person. Today we were celebrating Father's Day. And all fathers and even all mothers know how their eyes are constantly on their own. All other kids are nice and good. Because as a parent, your eyes, like we heard today from the tributes that were paid, your mind is on your kid. That's what fathers work for and live for. And, and they do what they do every day and they go to work every day and they come back and, and they go back again the next day and they, and they earn money and they set money aside and, and plan for the future because they're thinking of their family. They're thinking of their kids, right? And a tribute to all those great dads. The same way, when God looks down from heaven, his eyes are on you. Oh, of course, God loves everybody. He makes the sun to shine on the righteous and on the wicked. The rain to fall on the good and the bad. But his eyes are fixed on you because you are the called one. And he's talking not about the call to ministry. He's talking about the call to salvation. That's the kind of call he's talking about. Because you cannot come and receive salvation unless the Holy Spirit moves upon you and calls you. You know that. That is why even when you're preaching the gospel, even at a mass evangelistic meeting, some people will be moved. Some will be even moved to tears. Next to that person, there will be another person who will be like an ice block. Will not be moved at all. They are both hearing the same message. One person is broken, the other is not. Why is that? Because a person who is broken has divine activity going on inside. The Holy Spirit is moving on that person. And when the Holy Spirit is moving, what he's doing is he's calling that person to come to salvation. And if you look at your testimony, your life, you'll find that if you know Jesus as your personal savior, and if you ever experience his grace in your life, there was a time when God began to work on you, in your heart. You couldn't explain it. The touch of God is there. You heard and you responded and you can't explain it. It's nothing but the work of God. How many of you can testify to that? Right. It's the grace of God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. You are called. And when you are called, you respond. And when you respond, you realize that God has a purpose for you. He's not going to reveal everything to you. But he let you go through the storm. He let you go through the flood. He let you go through the fire. He let you go through all that. But he'll always hold your hand. Sometimes he'll take you out of the fiery furnace. Sometimes he'll leave you there. But he'll hold you. Nevertheless. And when you feel his hand on you. And you know that he's carrying you through what happens to you. Your response is a response of gratitude and love and appreciation for the faithfulness of God. You know, it's very important to go through tough times. Because if you don't go through tough times, you'll never know the grace of God. You'll never know the love of God. You'll never know the care of God. And as parents, you know, that is okay for your kids to go through tough times, right? What happens to kids who get everything they want? Right, Shami. You know it. They get spoiled. 
and they get instant gratification to the point that when they grow up, nothing in this world can satisfy them. Deferred and delayed gratification is the best way to train your kids. Then they'll appreciate things. You give a kid that 16 years or 18 years a motorcycle, what are you going to give him when he's 21? And 25, a helicopter? On the other hand, I've talked to many parents over these 40 years uh, in Sri Lanka and everywhere else I've been. And most kids I've talked to, though they grumble and complain when they are going through hard times, when they are big, grown up, they always look back at the tough times. And they are grateful that they learned something. And because of the tough times, they can understand others who have tough times. And you become a better human being. If you never go through tough times, it would be difficult for you to relate to others who have difficulties. I'm so glad for the times, most people don't believe this, that in our family, we had difficulty finding food. And our kids knew there was no food in the house. Not here. When I was a student in the US, doing my master's degree, carrying a load that was fine, uh, uh, academic load that was way out, beyond the normal, and then paying fees, three kids, two in diapers, my wife couldn't work, uh, she, she got a job, but just for a few hours a day. And there were times we didn't have food. And on top of it, we got robbed. Also. But looking back now, <laughs> I don't regret one thing. Because during those times, we saw God's provision in a miraculous way. And our kids saw it too. What has that done to them? It will do to any kid who's gone through rough times. It will give them a proper set of values about life. They'll appreciate things. And they will begin to understand that success doesn't come cheap and easy. It comes through hard work. That's why many rich people let their kids have a rough time, pay their way through school, and they do it. You can't do that much here in Sri Lanka, but I know we have friends overseas. They've got lots of money, but they let their kids pay their way through school and have it. If they have to work in their father's business, they don't give them a top slot immediately. They let them work from the bottom and work their way up. Because if you give something to a person who hasn't earned it, you know what he'll do? He'll ruin it. There are a lot of successful businessmen who work hard and build a business. They know what it is to trudge to office and, you know, really hustle in order to get business. And 20, 30 years later, they built a good business. And then their kids know nothing of that. And you give the kid that business and make him a director, he might trash the business. Everything that you work for. That's one of the reasons why. God allows us to go through tough times. One thing we should not imagine is that when things don't go the way we want them to go, is not because God doesn't care for us. Now that is a pagan philosophy. The pagan worldview says, if you're a good person and your gods care for you, everything will be all right. If things are not going well for you, according to the pagan philosophy, 
it's because the powers that be are against you that is totally antithetical to the bible if that was so then what would you do with the lord jesus christ who was perfectly sinless and he suffered as he did god lets us go through situations that we don't understand because all things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose now what's god's purpose god's purpose for every one of us first non negotiable is that we know him as our lord and savior and are filled with his holy spirit and then god has a, another purpose for each one of our lives that we may touch other people and be instruments in his kingdom and bring change into our world as we experience his power in our lives and it's good to remind ourselves the promise of the father was the promise of the holy spirit we celebrated pentecost sunday last week and god gives us gifts and abilities by the power of the holy spirit in order that we may fulfill his purpose in our lives and it is by the gifts of the holy spirit given to us that we discover god's will people don't realize the connection between the gifts of god and god's will for our lives sometimes you are praying and saying lord show me your will show me your will for my life hey stop shouting about that find out what your spiritual gifts are and begin exercising them and when you start doing the will of god in the kingdom of god god's purpose will automatically be realized in your life and there's a good example i talked about this morning uh, is from the book of acts chapter 8 about philip philip was an ordinary person look at philip in chapter 6 he's a deacon what was the deacon supposed to do they were not the decision makers in the early church the deacons in the early church were the servants they were the waiters when you go to your you know in neighborhood restaurant and you sit there and a guy comes and says what can i do for you sir uh, that's the kind of thing the deacons were in the early church and whom were they serving they were not serving the high and mighty they were serving the widows and 2000 years ago women were not respected much sorry girls but uh, you know they didn't think women had much knowledge or power or education and here not just nice looking girls but old women <laughs> many of them widows and they didn't have food and the church had a problem they didn't know how to manage that they called seven men now these guys were uh, top guys in their homes they were the big bosses everybody was serving them the children were serving them the wife was serving them and all that and uh, now they are asked to be servants in the church so they had to take the food from the food bank and go and serve the widows and what were the qualification required for this job they had to be men of wisdom and filled with the holy spirit because unless you're filled with the holy spirit you won't stoop to serve and you won't be humble enough to do god's work whatever he calls you to do and so he was a deacon philip and he was serving and he was faithful the bible says you are faithful in the little things you do what's god going to do for you he's going to give you more responsibility next thing you know there's a persecution in jerusalem and everybody is scattered all the believers go all over the place including philip and he goes to samaria and he now has been faithful in what he was doing and now he gets scattered to samaria beyond his control and all of a sudden he begins to preach and he realizes when he prays for people they get well and demons get cast out healings and miracles take place now he's got promoted and he is doing mighty things in samaria in fact philip was used by the lord he's an ordinary guy he was used by the lord to break open the gentile barrier you know what jesus said you will be witnesses for me in jerusalem judea that was their territory and samaria crossing the gentile going to the other side philip the deacon the waiter who humbly did what he was supposed to do was the one god used to do that and then he begins to serve there but he makes a mistake or two because he has on his evangelistic team a guy called simon the sorcerer and uh, 
Philip, though he had the gifts of healing, he didn't have too much discernment apparently. And so when Simon came along, he baptized Simon. And they were having a great time having meetings until Peter and John came on the scene. Aha, uh -huh, the bosses are coming. And Peter and John came. And when Peter and John came, Simon's real nature began to manifest. And Simon said, oh, if I can also have that power of praying for people and them getting the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, wow, if I can have that power, then that will enhance my sorcery business. That's exactly what Simon thought. That's the point when Peter really rebuked him. And can you imagine how embarrassing it would have been to Philip? Just imagine. What do you think Philip would have thought? Oh, my. If I was Peter, I'd have called Philip to a side and said, Hey, Phil, what's the problem? You haven't done one-to-one -one with this guy? <laughs> How come you baptized him? I don't know what Peter told him. <laughs> because it was a mistake, a misjudgment, a lack of discernment that Philip had. God uses ordinary people who make mistakes, who fail. Don't think that God's people are perfect. They always have 100% accurate discernment. And they know everything. No, no, no. You're honestly following the law. There are times when you will make mistakes. But the big thing about it is not about failing, but never failing to learn from your failures. And when Peter pulled up, uh, Philip probably, Philip was not so high and mighty and arrogant that he didn't want to take any correction. A lot of people abort God's purpose for their lives because of their inability to learn from others. And in Sri Lanka, we have a peculiar cultural trait. We like to choose from whom we learn. Some people don't like to learn from younger people. Others don't like to learn. I'm talking about church, churches, Christianity. Others don't like to learn from people of a different social class. All these kinds of wonky ideas we have. Well, you don't do that when you go to a doctor. If the doctor is an MBBS guy who's 25 years old, you know, you learn from him anyway. And what he tells you about your situation. I remember when I was a pastor, young pastor. I was in my 20s. And as I started, people began to tell me, Pastor, you're young. You learn as you go along. <laughs> I took it nicely, but I told them also one thing. I said, it's not age, it's mileage that matters. <laughs> I've been all over and I think I've studied a little more than you. And so I went on, I battered on, regardless. I realized it's a cultural problem. We like to choose from whom we learn. But God doesn't give us that luxury. He'll teach you through whom he chooses. Philip learned. And what do you find? Next thing, Philip is preaching the gospel. Great things are happening. And God speaks to Philip through an angel. <laughs> now, this is my analysis of it. Why did God use an angel to speak to Philip? Because his inner register was not that good. That's why he had Simon on his team. So, Philip probably, though he had gifts of healing and all, didn't really know how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and discern too well. So the Lord had to speak to him in quadraphonic sound. Only when he heard it in his ears and he had this angel, then only could he hear. And so he goes down 70 miles or kilometers down to Gaza and so on. And we read about how Philip, you know, preached the gospel. But the big thing about Philip is this, that he had continuous success in his life and he achieved all God's purposes because 22 years later, in Acts chapter 21, you find Philip still serving the Lord. He's in, he's in Caesarea. He's called an evangelist and Paul visits him. And the great thing about Philip reminds us on this Father's Day, he had a good home and he transferred his faith to his children. He had four girls who prophesied. Wow. That's, that's mega. 
If you have one who can prophesy, that's good. But he had four, and all four prophesied. <laughs> and you know how tough it is to bring up girls. <laughs> Boys are tough too. They are very tough. But Philip did a good job on that. He did a good job on that. He's a great father, family man, but he started small. God's purposes for Philip were fulfilled. God uses ordinary people, and just like the Lord did it for Philip, he can do it for you. He can do it for you. And just because you're having troubles and difficulties and confusion and you don't have all the answers, doesn't mean God doesn't want to use you. Right in the midst of all your difficulties, God wants you to listen to the Holy Spirit and be an instrument of healing and salvation and exhortation and deliverance to somebody else. And in the process of doing that, you will either receive your own healing or God will give you the grace to cope with your situation, whatever it may be. But as long as you excuse yourself and say, I have all these problems and I've got to have them solved before I serve God. You'll keep on having problems and you'll keep on not being used. The other option is better. Keep on having problems and keep on giving other people solutions. Life will be more meaningful then. That's what God wants to do for you. God uses ordinary people. Say it after me. God uses ordinary people. Therefore, he can use me. Therefore, he can use you. If God didn't use ordinary people, where would we be? Let's give God a chance to work in our lives. I want you to stand to your feet as we ask the Lord to help us. You know, the Lord has so much to do. And not only in Sri Lanka, but around the world. So many things that the Lord can do if we make ourselves available to him. Do you want to? Well, let's pray right now. And as you're bowed in his presence... I don't know how the Holy Spirit is ministering to you. I don't know what the Lord is talking to you about. Some of you are having tough times and difficulties. But remember, God is bigger than everything. He rides over the storm and over the storm clouds. And he speaks his word of peace to you. In the midst of that storm, his peace will be there. And he will hold your hand and he will guide you through and you will never fail because God is in control of all things. All things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And the Lord will perfect that which concerns you. Hallelujah. 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 Now just reach out to the Lord wherever you are and bring your situation before the Lord and tell him, Lord, my desire, my desire is to be used by you. Lord, I just offer myself to you. I'm an ordinary person. I need your touch in my life. Lord, help me, I pray. Just reach out to the Lord. No one can pray for you like you can pray for yourself. No one can really offer himself to God or herself to God like you can do. And I want to tell you, this day can be the first day of the rest of your life as you open yourself to the Lord. He's mighty to save. He's mighty. He has great things in store for every one of you. No exceptions at all. And the only thing that's keeping you from getting it is yourself. You've got to make that choice. Say, Lord, I want to step into the water. I want to get everything that you have for me. And I want to obey you, Lord. Just give me your grace today. I want to pray for you. We want to pray for you as you reach out to the Lord right now. If your desire and your prayer is to reach out to the Lord, just stretch forth your hand and say, Lord, I'm reaching out to you right now. Just stretch forth your hand right now and let the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you right now and let the Lord do His will in your life right now. Open yourself to the Holy Spirit and allow God to move in your heart right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have so much in store for your people. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Spirit is telling some of you, your eyes haven't seen, your ears haven't heard what things I have prepared for you. It's far beyond your imagination. You are looking at your own limitations. 
And because of your limitations, you're limiting God. Don't you know that there's a difference between you and God? You have limitations, but God has no limitations. And God specializes in the impossible. Nothing is impossible with him. It's one thing God wants, and he wants you to place yourself in his hands unreservedly, not conditionally, totally unconditionally, with no reservations. You have to say to him, Lord, whatever, whatever, whatever. Some of you need to deal with certain things in your lives. There are certain nooks and crevices you're hiding to yourself. You don't want God to invade those areas. And you think you can hide it from God. Yes, you can hide it from people, but you can't hide it from God. He sees it. He wants to penetrate and go into those areas. And he wants to scoop out those things that are contrary to his will. And he wants to put the power of the Holy Spirit in those very areas. In other words, if you have a weakness, if you have a defeat, if you have a besetting sin, God wants you to know that he wants to create power right there and give you the victory in the very area of your defeat so that you will be a walking miracle by the power of God. Hallelujah. Now receive his touch into your life because the Lord does not give a word without his promise to touch us. Now just receive it. Receive it in the name of the Lord. Father, I just thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your touch. Now as your people seek out to you, I pray, Lord, your glory will come upon them. Your hand would be upon them. And Lord, you will do mighty miracles in their lives and through their lives. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need a healing touch, put your hand on that place where there is pain. Just put your hand right where there is pain. Right now. Jesus is the healer. It's not by our own power or godliness, but by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right now as we pray, His healing power will flow right there. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Every pain, I rebuke it and I command it to go. In the name of Jesus. Be gone. In the name of Jesus. Be gone. In the name of Jesus. Be gone. In the name of Jesus. Be healed by His mighty power. Thank you, Lord. Now just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the symptoms are gone. Testify about it. Tell people about it. What the Lord has done. Hallelujah. He is mighty. He is mighty to save. God is great. Hallelujah.